Okay, so thank you for joining everyone um, to decision making around best management practices. Uh, I am Emily Fibri. I work at St. Clair Region Conservation Authority as the stewardship communications technician. So I work a lot with landowners and farmers, and I try and find them funding or provide them education opportunities to kind of uh, further our knowledge on best management practices. Um, and then the funding is for uh, implementing those best management practices or habitat restoration on their properties. Also on this call, I have Tracy Ryan from the Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association. Uh, Tracy is the Applied Research Coordinator and she's going to be our moderator for our panel questions as well. Then joining from the sunny south in Essex region is Katie Stamler, the Water Quality Scientist and Source Water Protection Project Manager. And then finally, and most important, we have our three farmers that are going to be presenting and discussing their decision making behind implementing best management practices. We have Chad Anderson from Lambton County, and then Henry Donotter and Chad Quinlan from Essex Region. So to get this started, I'm going to pass it over to Chad. Is it yeah, it's a, up? It's a, so it's a pleasure uh, to be with you all here this afternoon. Um, as Emily mentioned, I'm, I'm from Lambton County. I, I'm a fifth generation farmer uh, with my wife, Debbie. Our, our operation is, a, is predominantly a beef operation. We have a cow calf and backgrounding operation. We grow some grain and oil seeds, but our, our farm is heavily focused on forage production. Um, but my <coughs> other, my other uh, hat is I'm a certified crop advisor and I run a crop consulting business under the shingle of Anderson Agronomy Services. And I've been doing that as an independent advisor for uh, 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 just over, uh, just coming 20 years now, I guess. So, um, what I'd like to talk to you about today, uh, what I thought about was what I've been talking a lot with, um, with uh, my clients here the last couple of years, but in terms of improving soil health, is diversifying rotation. So I work predominantly in South Lambton. Uh, Morris Sagriff was an old mentor of mine and he would refer to them as the clay plains of Lambton County. Um, these clay plains are, are also down in Essex and Chad and Henry's neighborhood as well. So they're familiar with, with the challenges and the, the humbling soil that these can be. But so we've been, we've been experimenting with winter canola now for a few years. And it really is about diversifying the rotation. And I've stole this slide out of a presentation from Dr. Craig Drury. I think a lot of people are familiar with the rotation studies at Alora and Ridgetown, but this is from the, the Woodsley site uh, from Egg Canada. It's a long-term rotation study. And the, the key message that I like to, to talk about here is that as you increase the frequency of soybeans in rotation, you reduce the, the productivity of all your crops. So you can see as we go from continuous soybeans to a soybean wheat corn rotation, you go from 40 bushel beans to over 60 bushel beans. So that's a 50% that's a yield increase, right? But you can't buy that kind of yield increase in a jug at a local ag retailer or it's, it's just a simple, one of the simplest agronomy practices we can do to, to improve yields and soil productivity. Um, and we struggle here in Lambton. We just grow way, way too many soybeans. Probably the most common rotation here is that light green bar where we try to do soybeans, soybeans, wheat. Um, uh, uh, there is some guys that some, some farmers that do corn, soybeans, but usually it's a second crop of soybeans and then wheat again. So um, winter canola really was attractive in terms of bringing in a, a, four, a third or a fourth crop. Uh, but the nice thing about, the other thing about a winter crop is that you're always working, you're always working uh, that, that field when the soil is its strongest. You know, you're, 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 you're preparing the seed bed in the summer, you're planting late summer, early fall, you're harvesting in the summer. You know, it really reduces the chances of compaction. So um, it's, it's a great crop to avoid compaction. It's got a combination of a tap and a fibrous root. So it's, it's very good for soil structure. So 
But ultimately, the, the goal is to just simply grow fewer soybeans. So you can't get anybody to really uh, just go in because they think it's good. It's just good. It really, the, the decision around the BMP has to be based on economics. So if you, uh, so what I've done here is I'm just gonna show you a rough budget on, on, uh, on a winter canola crop. So uh, you can expect the yield range on winter canola from about one and a quarter to just under two ton to the acre, but we kind of budget, we aim to have, we aim for a one and a half metric ton per acre crop. If really, if we get to a ton per acre, we've really failed. Um, the, uh, but the last few years, one and a half tons is, is quite achievable. We've been, we've been probably averaging closer to 1.6. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it, that's kind of where we land. Um, I did check with uh, ADM at the first of the week and the, the new crop for pricing for canola at that time was $836 a metric ton. So like all grain and oil seeds, uh, canola has benefited from this, this inflation pricing and the old, you know, historically canola you would think of more in that $500 a ton range, but at, uh, at $836, it becomes pretty lucrative. And I think the other thing about canola going down the road as we look at biofuels, it is a, it is a very, it's an oil seed, but it's a really high oil content seed. So, it is a preferred crop for, for, for producing biodiesel. So anyways, at one and a half, you know, you get about over $1,200 an acre uh, in, uh, for, your, for your gross revenue. Next slide, please. So, um, it's not that expensive a crop to grow. Um, seed costs are about $57 an acre. Um, the nice thing about canola is a lot of the chemistry you use in it are, is older chemistry. And so there are lots of generic uh, products on the market. And when you get generic products on the market, that usually is pretty good for the, for your, uh, for the cost of the products. The big thing we have to control, you're gonna plant winter canola after winter wheat, but you have to plant it. Um, for crop insurance, you have to plant it by September the 20th. We've been aiming to plant most of it at the end of August now. It's one thing that we've learned the last few years, but, uh, you know, the one thing you do have to control is, is the volunteer wheat. And so that's where we got about a $12 an acre cost for that. Um, any annuals that come up will be controlled by the frost. So you want to just keep an eye for density. Uh, the, you know, lawn trail or clopyrrolid is a, is a broadleaf herbicide you can tank mix, but uh, you know, the big one there that you might want to chase is that you had a lot of flea bane because the flea bane would overwinter. But Canola is an exceptionally competitive crop. It grows just cr crazy. So um, we control is ge generally pretty easy. Next slide, please. Um, so I, this is just cut and pasted right out of our uh, provincial agronomy guide. So the, the nitrogen rates for canola are based on the price ratio of nitrogen to, uh, to, uh, to the price of canola. Right now we're um, in that 3.3 price ratio. And I would suggest that our, like our one and a half ton yield, it's a big nitrogen user at hundred, we would be targeting up to 180 pounds of nitrogen, depending on what you felt the yield goal was. Next slide, please. Um, the other thing in terms of soil health, especially for us, because our, our clay really limits when we can apply uh, soil organic amendments. So it's really nice to do that work in the summer. And canola is just a huge responder to, uh, uh, to the likes of manure or compost or, or if you're fortunate, maybe biosolids. Um, you can, if you can get those, it really, it really likes that. Um, it can help you with the higher cost of nitrogen because you can credit some nitrogen from that. And the other thing is Canola, canola and sulfur were the, I mean, canola and alfalfa were the first two crops in Ontario that were identified as being sulfur deficient many, many, many years ago. It is a, a large, a large user of sulfur. So if you use a if you use a soil organic amendment, um, more more than likely, so far in our little bit of plot work, 
you, you should be able to feed enough sulfur, but if you're not using any organic amendments, you'll wanna, you'll wanna apply another 20 pounds of sulfur in the spring for the canola crop. So, um, you know, and more, more in spring canola, but you can use seed place fertilizer. So uh, if, you're, uh, if you're not using organic amendments and you, and you have to do some, some fall fertility, you can use uh, seed place fertilizer, which is great because you're, you know, you, there you're incorporating it. So, you know, you don't have the risk of runoff. The, uh, the other thing is it's the most efficient way to use that phosphorus. So it is safe and, um, you know, it's uh, in the olden days, they used to mix it a lot with fertilizer because canola seed is such, you know, you're only planting five or six pounds or even less. So it can be hard to get seeding equipment down that rate. So you bulk up the seed with fertilizer to help plant it that way. And as I mentioned, I, I calculated that, you know, we would have 180 pounds of nitrogen would be our target, again, without a amendment. So that's $190 an acre at a dollar five on nitrogen, which is a recent price. It's been considerably higher than that earlier in the year. Next slide, please. A little bit of work at flowering because um, it, it's such an aggressive crop. White mold is, is an issue. So we, we typically will spray a fungicide uh, at you know, a little before half flower. Um, that costs about $20 an acre. We grew winter canola about 20 years ago, and we did struggle with seed pod weevil. Um, the last few years, we haven't seen that, but back 20 years ago when we were, when we were growing it, um, we were tank mixing an insecticide at, with that fungicide at that time to uh, control um, the uh, seed pod weevil. You want to be careful uh, there because we, we are, uh, you know, canola does is a terrific pollinating crop. It attracts it attracts all kinds of pollinators like crazy. It's a, the most beautiful thing you see when you're driving down the road and you have this field of yellow. Um, but uh, so you should you should have, you know target your if you're going to spray an insecticide you should target it to the evening to kind of help protect against hurting pollinators. Um, some people will put boron in the in the in at this time. There's very little work to uh, support that, but it's, it's quite common. Um, I would, if you're gonna grow winter canola, you know, try a strip with boron to see if it pays. Um, if you're using manures or compost or other organic amendments, you shouldn't have to require any micronutrients because um, they're very rich in that. So uh, next slide, please. So just a rough budget, you know, so we got a gross of over $1,200 We've calculated an input cost here just under three hundred dollars. So there's a there, you know there's a thousand dollars almost an acre here um, before rent or land cost, labor, fuel, your time and equipment. Um, I didn't put in here um, anything around pre-harvest desiccation. I know in Essex County they've been doing a lot of pre-harvest desiccation. In Lambton we haven't been. Um, we probably will this year because we have such a large wheat crop. Um, we'll, we'll probably pre-harvest the canola just to make sure we can get it off before the wheat. Canola, har harvesting canola is probably the hardest job or the most, not hardest, but it's the, it's the most confusing part of growing canola because you got to get it under 10% again because it's got twice the oil content of soybean. So it has to be ultra dry to go to harvest, I mean, the storage. Um, but anyway, so there's some really good financial opportunities, I feel, um, growing winter canola outside of the fact that, you know, we look at the soil health benefits and then the gains you're going to make them through all your rotation. Um, and then as we've been playing with it, I already mentioned down in Essex, there, they are double cropping after canola. We haven't been, we, we just haven't seen to be able to harvest it early enough to, uh, to make it, make that work. Um, there is a fair bit of interest um, to try planting winter barley after winter canola, which would be just a sensational rotation. You got winter wheat, winter canola, winter barley. Um, that would work really good. And then probably you could, you could double crop bar beans after that barley because it comes off much earlier. Um, and then lastly, it does give another good window for a cover crop in the summer after that winter canola harvest. 
if you are going to plant a cover crop after it, you should really try and include oats. Oats is a terrific uh, mycorrhizal host, a fungi host, and uh, we know we know the brassica families, whether it's canola or sugar beets, they are they are a real hard on your on that on that colony of fungus, which is the, one of your most important funguses in the soil. So planting some oats after that would help rebuild that that fungus level. So anyways, I just you know, that, that's my five my five minute talk. I hope I kept it to that. Um, I could talk for, for quite a length on winter canola. I'm really excited about it. But I'll I'll, uh, I'll move her, I'll let it on to my good buddy Henry, I guess, next. Okay, I'll turn my mic on there. So as uh, I was introduced to them, I'm Henry Donotter and I'm down here in Essex County, um, the southern half of the county. Chad's more in the northern half of the county, but uh, yeah, we still uh, we still share the county. So we're looking here at a uh, at a little uh, thing that we started probably six or seven years ago is adding a fourth crop to the three crop rotation. So you see uh, I've got on the board here three year rotation with four crops and that amazing little graphics that I have across the top of the screen here. I have to thank Tracy Ryan for taking my scribbles and coming up with this uh, colorful rendition that's a lot easier to read than the uh, chicken scratch I sent her. But uh, it was her idea and uh, also the pictures, most of these pictures uh, belong to Katie, uh, Katie Stanler and uh, Ian McDonald who uh, holds the whole course of last summer, took a lot of pictures to document what's going on on the uh, Living Labs project. So some of the things to note here, uh, we plant corn and soybeans in 20 inch rows. Uh, that's something we started 20 years ago. Uh, we looked at getting away from it, but we felt that it was working out uh, with the presence of modern GPS equipment and uh, the accuracy of the uh, equipment. We we're able to, uh, to make that work quite well because the 20 inch rows and an 18 inch tire, you're, uh, you're pretty well crowding that path. But as long as you plant nice and straight, uh, and keep an eye on things, uh, things, uh, things work out well. And the, the fact that we are going back through the crops different times, uh, we like to get, get our sprayer as big as possible. So we are spraying like 120 feet at a time. Going back to the graph, you can see that we are planting uh, the, uh, the corn in the spring. We've got corn growth and we matures in the fall. Of course, we harvest it. And we leave all that residue on the uh, on the soil. Uh, we try not, we don't shred stalks. We just leave them on the ground, and we come back in the spring and split the corn rows and plant beans on 20 inch rows. So that is this is the optimum way that uh, over the years of trying different things, uh, we've decided to try and do things. And then once we get through the spring, and then the soybeans through the summer. Soybeans are harvested, and like Chad said too, soybeans, um, they're a great crop and there's lots of money there, but they certainly take a lot out of the soil with them. So once we get through soybeans, we plant wheat, winter wheat, get into the spring, get the, uh, get the wheat off, which is a, a you know, midsummer job. So now we have this fallow field. We have, uh, we can take the, uh, the straw off and bale it and there's a down here there's quite a market for it because probably one of the biggest mushroom plants is right here in Essex County so there's always competition for that but the next thing to do is what do we plant so we started six years ago and introduced buckwheat we uh, we just direct seed it right into stubble some fields we take the, uh, the straw off because it'll canopy better uh, we get that uh, buckwheat grown through the uh, the canopy, uh, and it's a fast growing crop. Like two weeks, you can start to see flowers showing up if uh, if you've got good planting conditions. It doesn't take long, then you have all the bees coming in there. So to encourage that, we uh, we bring bees into the field. So you can see in the lower right hand corner of the uh, that's a buckwheat field, and of course. The set of wagon tracks where things have been going in and out and sitting there, but it's a good place to uh, to get all the bees lined up. And 
they will definitely help improve the, the buckwheat crop. And even better, if you've got a water supply nearby. So if you've got an irrigation pond or a ditch that's holding water or the neighbor's swimming pool, that uh, definitely will encourage the bees to stick around and, in, and get a decent crop. It doesn't take long, within three weeks, you can have a nice white flower, but also you have to be careful what you're gonna grow the next year. So we generally come back with corn again, try to keep this cycle going. And uh, you can see in the lower left, we've got uh, corn growing and we've got lots of volunteer buckwheat. That's from the year before. Buckwheat's pretty fast growing and I've seen it grow right up a corn plant. So we have found we need to spray it. We take it out, try and, try and minimize the, the damage because we're running you know, a large boom to get to just uh, give it a quick shot and get rid of that. Then the next slide there. So this is, uh, this is what buckwheat looks like after about three weeks. It starts to starts to flower, and it, we'll see it flowering for about uh, about six seven weeks at least. Um, you can see there's a bee in the uh, in the one picture here, and uh, my beekeeper there he likes to paint his bee boxes uh, pretty colors, so uh, it does uh, attract attention. And I generally um, put a sign in my fields that this is a pollinator friendly crop. So that's what started this whole uh, idea of trying to come up with something different. Yes, we can double crop soybeans. Uh, we can look at other different things and we'll probably spend the summer six weeks working the field up and making a dust cloud. But we were more satisfied with buckwheat. Uh, we, did, we did find a market for it, so that does help. And uh, we've been able to grow good buckwheat so that we can use it again to reseed. Got the next slide there. So this is uh, this is our, our system for uh, for 20 inch rows. Uh, of course, the sprayer runs down the down the, the field. It's it's set up right in this picture here to uh, Y drop 28 uh, percent. We also have a uh, a deep uh, deep ripper that we've got set at 20 inch rows for three doing uh, fields in the fall to help fertilize get fertilizer down there. Uh, this is especially important when we start new fields and we need to get uh, get the field in, the, in a better condition. Uh, there's been a lot of trials done where people have said that uh, mulchboard plowing didn't help my uh, corn crop, but I think chisel plowing did. Well, if you take that idea, the fact that you put a fracture in the ground and not really flop the ground over is uh, it all sort of falls into play. So we have found that uh, the uh, the ripper and putting fertilizer in in the ground does a, does a great job. And again, the importance is super straight rows and being able to get um, on the field and not uh, not drive on the row. And but we also have a backup plan. We do have a, a big air seeder that we can just directly seed into the ground, and we still get good uh, good placement of seeds. Uh, in the field, that's which is that it's important. But if you want something that'll suck up some horsepower, just put that uh, fertilizer tank and ripper together. Yeah, definitely. Okay, have the next slide there. So we do we do uh, work out with the uh, <clears throat> with the living labs people. And last summer we did have a an event and. We didn't have it like in the yard or in the barn. Well, we were in the barn to have some introductions, but we basically took everybody right out into the field and said, this is, this is uh, what uh, 20 inch corn looks like. You know, like it's uh, tight and you have to be able to walk through there. And uh, we have the uh, flume set up that we were catching water to, to look at what the water quality is. Because as a living labs project site, uh, our main theme, theme is it's all about the water. We want to know what the condition of the water is that leaves the field. You're cutting me off there. Uh, and the whole idea of, of the whole system is to look after the water. So we've got this little symbol that we made up here a year ago, and it's been identified by the, uh, 
the people, the girls at uh, at Urca, and uh, it's a, it's a cast iron fish. And if we don't look after the uh, the systems and check out what's going on and check for phosphorus and soil particles, and then try and change our farming practices to make it better, we're just going to end up with skeletons. And skeletons are not good eating. Of course, this thing's not good eating either. But uh, you know, it's it's the whole idea. It was a quick symbol that we were we were able to use and try to get people's attention. And Katie, did you have did you steal my last slide or is that it? That's your last uh, slide. Sorry, I was trying to okay. anticipate that you were ready for it. You left one out, but that's all right. Oh, did I? Yeah, it's okay. So the the whole the whole purpose is uh, is trying to keep cover crops the. Uh, the buckwheat is a great, great cover crop, but also when uh, it does produce well, we are able to harvest it and get some extra revenue out of the, uh, out of the buckwheat. Uh, we have sent it uh, uh, to different uh, destinations down in the Dakotas. We sent some to Japan through uh, our, a mill that we were dealing with who does all the cleaning. It, it does come off fairly dirty. Uh, and it's just kind of the crop that you do right about the time you're full scale in the soybeans and then going to to do corn. But that's pretty simply, you know, what we're at. We're trying to, we're taking the cover crop. We do grow other cover crops, but the, to take buckwheat one step further and try and make it a viable crop. So that's all I have, and I thank you for your time. I'll introduce myself again. I'm Chad Quinlan, <clears throat> Quinlan Farms. We're down here in Essex County as well. Like Henry said, northern side of, of the hub, Essex, uh, is where most of our farm ground is. Um, heavy clay. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're probably a, considered a small cash crop farm. Um, we do do a little bit of pasture raised pigs and chickens, um, laying hens. Um, and selling direct to the consumer. So we do a little bit of that as well um, that we've really started to get into the last couple of years as we've tried to implement some more things um, and, and utilize um, animals for, for fertilization. Um, I took the chance today uh, to some uh, best management practices on our farm that we, we've put in place for, for cover crops and, and maybe some of the things we've learned um, as we continue down our journey. Um, you can see there in the first picture there, um, you know, that's kind of what my kids like doing in the spring is going to look for, for worms. So that, that, that kind of captured that, that the worms are our friends and our kids love looking for them. So uh, that's our pastime in the spring. Um, we can go to the next slide. I think uh, the probably easiest one and one that I think, you know, as we try and break up these crop rotations, especially on soybean on soybean yields, it, it, years is, is cereal rye uh, up front. Um, it, it's very inexpensive to plant. Um, it gives you lots of options. You can spray it off, you can plant into it. Um, you know, even if it gets wet, you don't get it sprayed off. They'll grow together fairly fine. You can terminate it later. Um, it, it, again, it's breaking up that soybean on soybean. Um, uh, it's crop cycle, it's getting you a different crop in there. Um, it, it's adding to the recycling of nutrients. To me, that's, that's a pretty simple one to do. A lot of times if we do have to go soybeans on soybeans, um, you know, we're playing that rye right behind the combine like we would wheat. Um, so that's to me one of the first management practices we've added to our farm. Um, if you want to scroll ahead to the next. So another thing that we've probably learned is, is as you get into these more diverse cover crops, um, bigger cover crops and keeping them into the spring, um, you know, you got to be able to have a, a plan to getting it matted down. On, you know, especially something like that. So the first picture we saw with my kids is, is what that looked like later that uh, spring. Um, that's the same field, that's the same cover crop. Um, this was a wet year, so we're probably into June at that point in time. Um, so, so getting it crimped down, rolled down, 
uh, is key. And, and when you're dealing with these big covers, if you're going to go corn into it, you got to be really make sure you got a good legging base. As you can see, there's a lot of, a lot of vetch in that group um, versus cereals um, at that point in time. So our end carbon to end ratio was not completely out of whack. So we didn't see the hit that you can see uh, with corn in the, the big covers. So, you know, you can go and plant corn into a, you know, a cereal rye cover crop like we do with soybeans. You'd see some end tied up and what add cost to, to add that end back in uh, to, to not see a hiccup in your corn yields. Um, so, yeah, so we, we, we have the ability to crimp. Um, you know, we take it on and off the planter if we have to, or, um, you know, we're looking at maybe even a, making just a crimper on its own, uh, and leave the planter as is, um, plant and then crimp after. Um, next slide. So then you, you can see there, that's, that was uh, what soybeans look like. And that was, the previous picture, that's what we planted in that field with soybeans. Um, and that's just after they emerge. You can see the, the mat. We love seeing that mat uh, on the ground. That's going to help us conserve moisture throughout the summer months when things get hot. Uh, really helps with weed suppression. I, I know that year with that cover crop, we didn't come back in and spray anything. Um, you know, it, it gave us the weed suppression that we needed. There were some escapes, but it was pretty minute. And, and then <clears throat> beside it, you got what it looks like corn. I believe that corn was, um, uh, that's after pollination. Um, you know, as when I was checking cob size, I took that picture. So that's, was the same year, um, same mix, different fields, but you know, that's, that's kind of what was left on, on the ground that late in the season. Um, you know, by next spring, that's fairly, uh, our ground's fairly active now, uh, even more so when these pictures are taken, a lot of that'll be gone. Um, and then probably my last slide, and in, in, in if you want to scroll to that, it, it, it's just treat your covers like a cash crop from the sense of, um, you know, we really think if you're going, um, if you're going in, especially if you're going in a diverse mix, um, and you want to make sure you have enough legumes and diversity in your mix. Um, and you want to plant corn after wheat. Um, getting established stand and consistent stand um, after wheat is, is very key. So we make sure we plant everything. You, you got to be careful you're not going too deep, um, not too shallow, you know, because you got different seed size. You got, you know, if you have like peas and, and veg and, and rye, it's all very, very different seed size. And, and, you know, some can be too deep, some can be too shallow. So it's to find that happy medium so that you can make sure you have a consistent stand coming into the spring. Um, so you get the same consistent across the field. What we found on years, or, or maybe we've made some mistakes, is if you have an inconsistent um cover crop it makes planting very difficult especially on a wet year um you'll have areas that are ideal and areas that are still wet and uh you know uh, if you don't want to run a piece of equipment through it to try and even that out uh you know the cover crop can can make it challenging i mean that that's true even a little bit on cereal rye and soybeans you still want to have a consistent stand um of that as well and we drill out all our cereal rye um, every once in a while, we'll spread some over top of some corn stalks if, if the fall is right and we think we're going to get some moisture and enough to get it established. But for the most part, we're, we're trying to plant everything. Um, so that was my, my, my quick presentation that I put together. Great. Um, I'm Tracy Bryan. Thank you, um, Emily, for uh, sharing slides, uh, you and Katie, and to Henry and Chad and Chad. And uh, I'll start with a few questions. So what I find interesting anytime I, I am chatting with producers or listening to your presentations uh, is you each are on a journey. So I guess I'll start with Chad Quinlan because you're I, the most recent presenter. What started you on your journey? What was the moment or the, the factor that uh, started you changing things up or making, making changes? 
Um, water infiltration was our, our big starter. Um, I hated ponding. Um, any rain event, it frustrated me that we'd get an inch of rain and we'd have water laying and, and, and dealing with all that. And then all summer long, we'd fight to get moisture and, and, and you know, you get an inch of rain in August and half it run off. So I, I, water infiltration probably would let us down this path. Um, and, and we've seen that increase uh, substantially. And then, you know, once you, once you get down maybe the rabbit hole, so to speak, um, you know, you start seeing the other benefits that are that come along with it. But water infiltration was a big thing for us and what, what started us back in, into looking at cover crops for sure. Great, thanks. And uh, Henry, I think you've said it's all about the water, but what, what made you enter on this journey to, to change things up and adopt your, a different system? Well, I think the, the, the very beginning is like moving to 20 inch rows. So like, that's something we started like 20 years ago. And, you know, we're thinking about it, uh, needed to, to change some equipment. So it's, uh, and it's actually going to, uh, to Ridgetown to one, one winter and listening to a couple of uh, speakers. And uh, it's just the big topic was 20 inch rows and the philosophy about it. So I says, okay. First of all, we need to make sure we have the right philosophy and then make 20 inch rows work better. And if we're going to do 20 inch uh, beans, let's go do 20 inch corn and, and trying to get the whole no till concept. And it just evolved from there. We just move over putting beans in, in between corn rows. It didn't always work in the beginning. It took a little bit of uh, fooling around because it seemed like the, the uh, corn stalks wouldn't let the ground dry it out. And that's a that can be a real problem in the, in the spring on some of the heavy ground is making sure that the uh, ground is drying up the, the plant. But uh, yeah, you just uh, you, you you try another idea and uh, and you make it make it work. And and what what made what problem were you solving with your twenty inch rows or what challenge? Well, the, like the uh, we found we didn't need to shred the corn stalks. We to, we just needed to to get the cobs off and just let the stalks lay down. And everything, every time we plant, the there's no tire running on a row. So we're running those corn stalks over and that was, a, that helped a lot and helps keep the machine up. And of course, uh, you know, you want to get, you want to do it uh, with the least amount of tillage. So all of a sudden you're looking at a, at a 40 foot planter to try and get as much done as possible and distribute the weight out. And uh, like our tractor, we didn't, we didn't have a picture up there, but our planting tractor is on triples and duals in the front. And they're all 18 inch tires. They're not very wide, just so that we can get in between the row. And uh, if you can plant in between the tires and don't crunch that, that soil, that helps a lot. Great, and Chad. Anderson, what was your yeah. Oh, just, moment? Uh, yeah, this, uh, well, the, so the moment was uh, when I heard uh, Dr. Drury speak on, uh, on the rotation study at Woodsley and, and quantified it. We know, we know soybeans are hard in rotation, um, but if you farm in South Lampton County, you, you, you come up with excuses why we grow beans on beans, right? Like it's, um, you grow beans on beans because the second your beans will ripen earlier and that, so you can get your wheat planted earlier. Like, but what happens to us is we plant, we go, we go beans and then we put the second crop of beans in, they get rained on and they get crusted in and you replant and then the replant's late. Then you put wheat in that fall, but it's late because of harvest. And so you take the wheat out and then you put beans back in, depending on depending on your patience, right? You're three or four years of beans before you say, oh, I'll just keep the wheat. I can't grow beans again. And then the wheat doesn't yield. And you say, I can't make wheat, make money on wheat. So I'll just keep growing beans. And it, it, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's just, it just, we are so, so wrapped up in the soybeans here. And it, it makes, it just makes so many challenges we have. You know, we we we're you know as we see water hemp come in now, like we we have just tremendous 
pressure on, on uh, herbicide resistance. Um, but now that water hemp's moved in, like it's just a monster weed. And we, it's uh, rotation is, is the easiest, easiest way to, to deal with and being able to, you know, change your growing seasons, change your herbicides. Um, it's, it's really a rotation. I, I mentioned we grew canola 20 years ago and we gave up on it because it just went up winter. Um, it, it, it's a crop that is easily heaved and clay soils are way more susceptible to that pre thaw cycle. And you just couldn't depend on it rotation wise. One of the biggest challenges with canola is herbicide rotation. You just can't use any herbicides in, in your other crops because some are more persistent than others. Um, but you know, just before the virus come through, I was at a down in, at the Essex and Kent uh, AGMs, and that year they focused on alternative crops, and they were there was presentations on winter canola and hemp. And Megan Moran, who is the was is the provincial canola specialist, she was talking about how some guys in Essex were using corn planters and planting plant using the planter and planting it twice to get 15 inch rows. Um, and that the, the plants were even and that's what and they were spaced good so that's what kind of helped them with the heaving and that's kind of what brought us back um and uh and so we started fooling around with plant using the planter we always used to drill before um so i think we're going to go back to the drill um uh but uh it was you know it was that soil those soil crop meetings that uh, kind of sparked the plug again and and it's it's been fun great segue Chad, to, to um, what role does, uh, I, I heard Henry talk about attending meetings, you've talked about Craig and Drury uh, and uh, attending soil and crop meetings, and I know all three of you are very active in both the local region, you've been active at the provincial level and the re and, uh, region. What, what role does being involved in a local association, whether it's soil and crop or, or another play in your decision making and I'll kind of open that up and then we'll go to questions from the, the audience. Well Henry, so like that, that was a great that was a great that was kind of what spurred I remember reading there was there was the art a few articles about winter canola uh, in the in the paper or crop magazines and I said oh that'll never last what's old is new again and it'll be a little it'll be a flash in the pan. I'm not wasting my time again. But you go to a you go to a meeting with your peers, right? And and hear and hear it firsthand. Um, it 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 spurs you, right? And uh, you know, seat test and adopt, and uh, that's that's uh, what we aim to do. And you know, you get challenged by others. So now it's 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 hey. it's you know, I've been a soil not as long as Henry, but I I know uh, I got I went to my first soil and crop meeting the month before I got married, and I've been married. 30 years. So it's, uh, it's been a really great experience for me. Great. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that, that. That was not a paid advertisement, but um, certainly um, I know that um, testing, adopting, um, I heard you talk about try a strip. Um, Henry, I've heard talk, Chad Quinlan, same thing. Um, trials, research, what, what uh, kind of you know, you know what, what Tracy? Sometimes when you're in a in a meeting and you and of course when there's a coffee break and you have to have to have something to talk about. And I remember sitting at a at a meeting and uh, you know and actually this meeting I believe I had a suit on of all things, which is uh, not that most comfortable for me. But anyway, I get to talk to an old fella and I, I says I'm thinking about getting some buckwheat and growing buckwheat. And this is the uh, and you know, just looked at him and said, "What do you think?" And he just goes, "So, when are you going to get the goats?" And I goes, "Get the goats?" I was just, you know, kind of just threw me off. He says, "Well, yeah, if you're going to go buck buckwheat, you're probably going broke, so you might as well get some goats to go with it." Yeah. You know, so you get you get challenged too, eh? inadvertently. And 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 it was kind of like throwing the gauntlet down, probably for you. Yeah. <laughs> Chad Quinlan, how about you? Yeah, no, for sure. It, it, it you know the soil and crop and and some of these groups are are, are great for uh, seeing what other people are doing in other regions. Um, you know, connecting with people that maybe are doing similar things to you or or have learned some things that you're trying to do. 
um, in your similar environment. So, uh, you know, it's just a, a good sounding board and an open dialogue and, and maybe, you know, some of that comes outside of, um, you know, or comes at break time and, and some of those other things. But, uh, you know, I think that's the, that's the, the great thing with, with those, with that organization for sure. Thank you. We have some questions from uh, our, our viewers, I guess, our participants. And Nick Stockman has a question. Um, since I've got you, Chad, I'll go to that one. Do you have any um, concerns about the potential for Harry Vetch to become a weed? Mike Calbro has concerns about that. Uh, you know, anytime I guess you're planting a small hard seed like, like Harry Vetch, if it doesn't germinate, I guess at some point in time it could come back. Um, but as far as, as long as you're not letting it go to seed, it's very good at fixing nitrogen. And, and maybe that answers, you know, I see Katie's uh, question as well is, you know, yeah. if you're not harvesting the, the, this for, for cash or feed, you know, it's the nitrogen credits that you're going to pick up is how you're going to get your cost back and the nutrient recycling, um, you know, is there exact dollars to cents on that? No. Um, but if you're able to fix quite a bit of nitrogen with a heavy legume crop um, in front of your corn crop, I, I think that's, you know, that's pretty easy to, to calculate that. Um, and then, yeah, you know, the cereal rye as it cycles nutrients. But no, we're not worried about hairy vetch becoming a weed. Um, if you terminate it and take care of it properly, um, you know, I think we had it all the way till late June and it's still hadn't gone to full maturity yet. So, um, you know, there's lots of times to deal with it before it, it becomes a seed. It, it, it uh, lays down pretty good, um, fixes a lot of nitrogen and, um, you know, it's got a low carbon score, so it'll, it'll burn up pretty quick too. I, you know, to Chad's point, uh, you know, you look at those slides that Harry had, uh, Henry had, right? Like, uh, and I've grown buckwheat before and it, it it is. It just all comes back. It's a new weed. Um, the old saying is, "Once a canola grower, always a canola grower." Like we were, we were finding canola for 20 years after we grew it 20 years ago. That's that's not a, uncommon, but you know, so it adds a little bit more complexity to the management. But at the same time, you know, this diversification. You know, there's lots of lots of research to show the benefits it covers in terms of weed control. You know, I, I've just been watching some of the A conference uh, sessions and, you know, Peter Sikkim, uh, you know, he talked about how we can, we have to get off our dependence of chemical weed control, especially when you work, look at this goofy water hemp, right? Like it's, we have to incorporate multiple management practices and cover crops play a huge part in that. So I would rather have a cover crop or grow one of these alternative crops that create some more management problems in terms of weed control rather than make an environment that we're, we're, we're really challenging weeds and weeds that can be, create these resistant problems and, and, and really cause uh, economic injury. I'd, I'd rather be on, on Chad Quinlan's side of the page than, than, uh, than what Henry talks about the guys making dust all summer long in, in the, uh, in, in, on that weed stubble, right? So, yeah. Yeah, and, and 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 you know, cereal rye in front of soybeans is is a great for flea bane, anyways. Um, flea bane hates cereal rye, and and we've really seen a farms that we've had decent flea bane pressure, and and the cereal rye has really helped keep that at bay for sure. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Chad, because I think that that's important. That's one of the the findings of Living Lab uh, with Greg Vermeersh's uh, double or relay cropping with the. Uh, the cereal rye. He shows one slide where between his two trials where he had cereal rye and didn't have cereal rye. And the flea bane is completely controlled on the one where he had that cereal rye um, and then had the soybeans in. So Henry, there's a question for you from Nick Stockman as well. Um, what is your herbicide program for buckwheat? And uh, back to this, what, what uh, we were talking about, that it can be persistent as uh, both you and Chad have said. So what is your herbicide program? So basically once, once you plant the uh, buckwheat, just about anything you put on there will kill it. So we, what we do is we burn the field down uh, in August with Liberty. So that takes care of anything that is snuck through the wheat field. 
and Liberty, uh, it works great, you know, in that mid afternoon sun, just flood it with, uh, with a good uh, 20 gallons and you can uh, burn all everything off. Uh, and I guess then you just have to go with the, with the flow. And we've got basically had some pretty clean fields. We do have a few escapes, but nothing that we've had to, uh, to go around. Now, the following year, when you're planting corn, and that's why I think I said, uh, you have to make sure you watch what you're going to plant. Like you definitely want, don't want to come back with uh, with something that uh, you know, like well, even soybeans, because you're going to get uh, you're going to get a lot of uh, escapes and growth. So generally, we plant corn, and if we do have enough visual uh, plant growth, we will go through there and give it a light uh, a light shot with uh, with glyphosate and uh, take the buckwheat out. Henry, why don't you be back? Hey, Henry, why don't you talk about your your uh, chaff management? You've been working on that with the, you know, the buckwheat was giving you some challenges there. And... Yeah, and so we, we, do, we do have, um, we do have a, a chaff uh, spreader on the combine to make sure that all the chaff is spread evenly as possible. Now, it's pretty hard to get a chaff spreader that will spread uh, the full 40 feet, but we do get it spread out even. That is important. If you don't get the the wheat chaff spread out, and then you get the buckwheat chaff on top of it. Um, you'll have uh, you'll really be pissed off when you go to plant corn the next year. Okay. And, and while we're still while we're still talking about herbicide, I, yeah. I guess probably BMP we would probably have too on our farm that I didn't add on when it comes to herbicide. If you're gonna let it grow green into the spring. Um, you know, make sure that the, the cover crop is active and metabolizing and the forecast looks good before you go um, put herbicide down. I know we were guilty a few times of, you know, until we learned our lesson. Ah, oh, it's, it's drying off. Let's get the sprayer across. Let's kill off that cover crop. And then, you know, it's 40, 50 some degrees for a week and a half. And you just don't get the kill that you're looking for. So, um, you know, something to keep in mind if you are going to keep things green in the spring and, and, and you're nervous about it getting too big, uh, I'd probably say you're better off to wait and, and get the kill the first time. Okay. Any other questions or, or I'll just um, provide one more to wrap up. So if there's any other questions for, the, um, for our panelists that are burning from anybody who's who's in attendance. I have a, a one more and I think, or two more. I think I'd ask each of you to name your biggest challenge that you are going to work on or need to address and, and the biggest benefit that you see from, from the practices that you're doing. So um, using the uh, Hollywood Squares approach, Chad Quinlan is, is closest to me. So Chad, what's, what's your greatest challenge and the biggest benefit that you see? Our, our biggest challenge is, is probably consistency in the cover crop on our, on our ground. Um, we probably have a few when I look at what we're trying to do. Um, it's probably that. And then it's that more, more crops into our rotation um, in a no-till system. So, you know, uh, canola is on our docket for this year. We're going to try and no-till it. Um, I know I've been told multiple times that's a no-go. Um, so we're going to prove them wrong and we're going to make it happen this year. Um, and, uh, in incorporating more livestock for, you know, who from a farm asset that wasn't livestock, um, involved until the last couple of years on a small scale, it's, it's how to get more animals out onto the countryside. I think that's so key to our overall soil health and, and just overall health of things in general. Um, and then what's our biggest benefit? Uh, you know, it, it's, we started, when we started, we said we give it five years because it takes time to change a cycle um, and a program and, and we haven't turned back. I think we're closing in on 10 years that we've been doing this. Um, you know, you put a shovel in the ground and that's, you can see the benefits right away. Um, it's the recycling of nutrients. Yeah, has there been tons of challenges and learning curves along the way? Yeah, for sure. But some of our ground that's in the, has been in the program for a while. It, it, it's it's becoming almost easy to be, you know, become very easy now. The ground's so so mellow. Um, you know, we got tons of worm activity. We're getting water in the ground quicker. 
you know um it's almost like planting into like a a compost up at the top layer so um I, I think that's been the biggest benefits is you can physically see it when you put a shovel in the ground and you can see the life come back to the soil and the smell um you know I think sometimes if you go to some farms and you dig a shovel in the ground, smell the soil, it doesn't have much of a smell, um, you know, so, uh, you know, we're starting to see that too. Um, so no, those are some of the, the, the benefits for sure. Right. Thank you. Uh, Henry. Yeah. So where, where we go, I think that what, you know, as, so, as it stands now, buckwheat's been a kind of a standard especially after wheat as far as cover crop. Uh, we always have had uh, a field or two or a percentage of the crop with uh, other cover crops to overwinter. But I think we'll probably try running, letting rye go further. You know, the Chad's, Chad's field's not the only ones I've seen. I've got other uh, guys that I've been uh, talking to. And, and you know, I, I said, look at it. Just, man, that's a snarly mess you're trying to plan into. But uh, they reassure me that, that there's no problem, but I'm not that easily reassured. Uh, we will we will definitely uh, try because like like uh, the uh, the crimping system, that's one last pass of herbicide. So if we can get some of this stuff in the ground and get get the fertilizer down, we don't uh, we don't own a lily spread or anything. We don't spread fertilizer all of the top. We pretty well put all the fertilizer that we need to put on with the with the air seeder we drill it in the ground so uh yeah it's uh that that's where we're going to try and improve that system more and more and uh and, and less spray okay and the biggest benefit in dollars <laughs> which leads to um i think is what chad was saying and 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 chad quinlan and also that leads uh probably comes back to Katie's question, you know, um, this idea of a fourth crop and the covers, making it profitable, encouraging uptake. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. Yeah, for sure. All right, Chad Anderson, we're, we're your biggest challenge, where are you going and, and what's the biggest benefits? So the, the, the uh, so we've been playing with winter canola for three years and I think we're pretty close uh, to a, to a recipe. Um, the farmers that I work with, we continue to increase our acres. We went from playing with it to, you know, we basically, most of these uh, farmers have doubled their acres every year. Um, and I think we've gained confidence with the stuff we've learned to make it uh, a part of our, like a, a good a solid part of our ro planned rotation. I. You know, yeah, I think I often think I, I I like to poke my head in the organic circles. I think some of some organic farmers, there's some stellar organic farmers here in Lambton County, and you know it, for them, you know they don't have the magic of of pesticides. Right, they have to use all the all the old school tools to to uh, to to grow a crop. And you know, an organic farmer once told me you need seven crops in a rotation. So, you know, my 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 long-term goal is to continue to look for more crops to include rotation to diversify it. Um, and right now, if we can solve the win if we think we've solved the winter canola solution, it it creates a window to plant winter barley, like I mentioned in the slides. And um, I just love I just love winter crops on this crappy play. Like it's you, it, you just you should stay off it when it's wet and it's dry in the summer. So let's farm it in the summer. And there's been a few these new winter barley varieties that are out have been have been showing some tremendous yield potential. Our biggest our biggest challenge with with barley is going to be finding the market. It's just um, it's fallen out of flavor or favor. I mean in the feed trade because all these, you know, distillers grain and all these other byproducts and barley wasn't being produced. So it's just, it's, it's, it's got a challenge for marketing, but um, it does, it does, it is great. It's great sow feed. It's great cattle feed. You know, the, the prairie provinces, they have a great beef industry based on barley. So 
that, that's where that's where we're headed next in winter barley. Yeah, but Great. I don't know. You got to find us a market, Chad. You're the marketer here. You can find us a place to sell it. That'd be cool. Well, I'm. I know we could continue our discussion. Um, I really have appreciated um, you three gentlemen giving your time uh, today, and uh, for Emily um, for organizing this. I think it was uh, fabulous to hear your your um, your thoughts and your journey. And and uh, I think Chad's remarks, or you've all actually linked a few things together. It's not as simple as exactly what you do on your field. There's also the market to to consider and all those um, other uh, drivers and impacts um, and effects. You know, Chad was talking about the price of fertilizer. It's now down again, but it can go up again. And, and all of those things that impact the choices that you make and the decisions on your farm. Um, and there's a lot of factors at play that you can control and many that you can't. So um, I appreciate you sharing. Thank you.